This video is about ankle sprains and rehabilitation through an ankle sprain, but in a more total body perspective, because the results of an ankle sprain or the, the effects of an ankle sprain are not just at the ankle, they can also reverberate throughout the entire body. And I have a book on the vestibular system, which is your balance system, uh, which includes your brain's input from the inner ear, vision, and your feet and ankles, which really mean the ground, all that sensory input comes together to provide postural stability. And when an ankle sprain occurs, those inputs, those sensory inputs, your brain loses one of the main inputs. That's, that's the input from the foot and the ankle because it stiffens up because it's injured. And that's what happened to me recently. I actually uh, sprained my ankle. So it went, so this is the right foot and you know, in the left AIC pattern, most people have a right foot that's a little bit more supinated. So this would be pronation where the arch comes down and then supination would be, uh, looks like a higher arch on the right side, but people often on the right foot, they feel the weight on the outside of that right foot. So that's a kind of a supinated right foot. So when I was doing my physical activity that I was doing, I kind of rolled out even further on that ankle. So I guess that would be an inversion so the, the, heel, the heel inverts, the foot inverts, uh, sprain. And it was enough to become pretty, it got pretty swollen the next day. I woke up, because uh, it happened at night, and I woke up the next morning, it was pretty swollen and kind of painful. I was able to bear weight on it, and it's been two days now. The swelling has gone down, and I can walk around, but what I can't do, so I was just treating it with compression and elevation. Uh, I was told that ice is not always the best idea after the initial injury. So on the second day, I did some ice in the beginning, but after that, I didn't really do ice, uh, just mostly compression and elevation. But this is the interesting thing. What am I feeling already? I'm feeling, now my right foot is stiff, so I can't go through pronation and supination. It's just kind of staying in kind of a stiff state. And if you can't go through supination at heel strike, pronation, and then resupination as you push through the big toe, so heel strike, arch, pronation, and then resupination is when you push through the big toe and, and go to the opposite side. That's the important thing. You don't just push with your foot for no reason. You push with the foot to get you to the opposite side. My foot can't do that right now because it's healing. And so I can't push with this right foot. So how am I actually moving myself forward? Well, I have to use my hip flexors on the right side to pull me forward. When a foot is immobile, you have, and you can't push. So if you have an ankle sprain, your foot gets tight and restricted. You still need to walk forward, but you can't push appropriately. And when you can't push, because you're not weight bearing appropriately, your brain will not allow it to happen. It's trying to protect the area. So you start to pull your leg forward using your hip flexors. Uh, then the right glute, I'm not using my right glute right now to push me forward again, because I can't stay, I can't go through proper supination, pronation, resupination. I can't go through that foot movement that's natural because of the injury. So you start to use compensatory movement patterns. This is the problem. What if that, now this happens, I'm only in my second day. I already feel my right hip flexor and my right adductor being overactive. Now this can, when, when an injury is really bad, this state of affairs can become a little bit too normalized. What if you don't do anything? What if you rehab the ankle just by getting range of motion back, but you never ad address the fact that you started to overuse your hip flexors to stabilize, not only to, to move your leg forward on the right side, but because your brain has literally lost sense of the ground. So when you lose your ankle and you lose your foot movement, your brain loses sense of the ground underneath that foot. It's only gonna feel the ground underneath one area, and that will probably be the outside it then loses sense of the ground underneath the right arch, and that becomes a threat. So you tighten up further, because that's a threat to fall. You need to sense the ground underneath the heel, the outside, the inside, and underneath the toes. When you're staying in one position, you lose the ground underneath the big toe and underneath the arch. You're probably only gonna sense, your brain will only sense, the, you might not be cognizant of this, but your brain is only gonna sense the ground in certain areas. That becomes threatening because that means you could fall. Remember, this is all about staying upright. That's what your brain is concerned with. Once you're standing, it just wants you to not fall as you move forward. 
So it will do anything it has to do to stabilize your body in the absence of instability. So your tight foot or your injured ankle is now creating instability because the foot can't go through a full range of motion and that's a threat. So the ground is no longer being sensed. And this is normal in the left AIC, right BC pattern, but it becomes even heightened when your body's in a heightened sense of security because of an ankle injury. So now you're in threat and what happens when you're in threat? To not fall, your brain will start to recruit certain musculature. And it's gonna come mostly through hip flexors, lower back and neck, and also probably your calves. So just to show what this really is like in the real world, again, I'm gonna, this book, The Vestibular System, it talks about vestibulospinal system and postural control. So your upright balance system, which is what walking and standing really is, depends on input from the eyes and through the feet and you know what your your inner ear. But so what they did, what they showed was that when the ground, they would take sub test subjects and they would move the ground from underneath them. So every time you walk, when you're taking a step, the, the ground is moving behind you because you're stepping forward and your brain senses this. So when they take a test subject and they put someone on the, on the platform and they move the platform backwards a little bit, the person falls forward. And what they found, and then they, just, then they were measuring what does the person do to remain upright? And in order to remain upright, so they write, we illustrate the various strategies by considering the reactions to forward body sway. So the body sways forward, and what's the strategy that the brain uses to keep you upright to not fall down? The resulting force moves the center of mass backwards towards its original position. So whatever force is generated by the muscles as they try to pull you back up, moves your weight backwards to where your weight was originally, or at least it's attempting to do that. In the hip strategy, there's a combination of extension of the knees together with flexion of the hip. So whenever you're see, whenever you extension of the knees, when you ever, whenever I see someone standing with extended knees, I know they're falling forward. Their hip flexors are going to be on because that's going to also result in a pelvis. When you lock out your knees, the pelvis has to fall forward. And one, but now that's going to put you in this position. So. If the pelvis falls forward and your body comes forward, again, you now have to do something to prevent falling forward again. So you're gonna arch your back and you're going to posteriorly rotate your head. So you're gonna, you're, you're gonna use your neck also. And that's exactly what they say. Of interest in present context, the hip strategy engages neck muscles, bringing the head into nearly erect attitude, similar to that seen in the ankle strategy. Uh, of the two motor patterns, the hip strategy can affect a larger, faster movement of the center of mass and tends to be used when the subject perceives that there is a greater change, challenge to postural stability. When you get into these patterns or when you have an ankle sprain, that is, that is a threat to falling. So you will start to overuse hip flexors, calf muscles to control the ankles, and neck and back extensors to stabilize your body. The problem is if that never, if the rehab that you do for your ankle, and again, I'm not really doing rehab. I'm just, I was just keeping it elevated and compressed so the swelling goes down. And then I'm gonna do my PRI exercises because my ankle probably doesn't need any special rehab. I know it doesn't, but I have to get, I have to stop using, now that my brain is saying, hey, there's a threat here, I'm gonna start using these hip flexors to try to pull this leg forward and to stabilize this right side, I have to get that to drop off. You don't want that to become the norm. Now, I've been doing PRI for so long, I don't think I'll have any problem. I know it's gonna take a right arch. I need pronation of the right foot. So I need pronation of the right foot to get my right glute back into my life to push me forward, coupled with heel strike on the left, left hamstring, and a pelvis that is shifted to the left. That's should really all I'm gonna really need a right glute and a left hamstring to rehab this ankle sprain. Because the ankle sprain, again, is not a big deal all by itself. It becomes a big deal when your body adopts compensatory 
strategies to stabilize you and move you that then doesn't get taken away. It just becomes normalized. And now you're, even, you're in a pattern even stronger. An example of a Postural Restoration Institute technique that would help rehab a right ankle sprain is the left side lying right glute max that you see in this end screen. So you should watch that video next.